Okay, let's get started here. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Pagel, Program Manager for Greening Healthcare, and today's webinar is Changing Direction with New Hospital Energy Performance and Emissions. This is our annual review of the energy performance of new hospitals we've done for several years now. To date, we've only done this for the Ontario hospitals that are using the P3 model, but this year we decided to open it up to other locations and see what their data is saying. So in addition to the Ontario hospitals, we're looking at Alberta, Manitoba, also New York, California, and Oregon today. Uh, this will be followed by a case study of the new women's hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we'll be joined by Miles and John on the second half of the episode. Uh, the agreement with participating hospitals sharing data is that we don't actually show the names, and we just list them in this presentation by code. So I did send out the codes to most of the registrants yesterday. If I missed you, or you're on the call and, and signed up late, just reach out during the webinar and I can tell you your code. We are recording today and should be posted on our website within the next week. And also please use the Q&A option with any questions and we'll take breaks periodically for those. Greening Healthcare is pleased to be partnered with CHES, Canadian Healthcare Engineering Society. And I know many of you did sign up from their distribution, so we appreciate them helping to communicate our events. Uh, thank you to our program sponsors, as always, Belimo, Elliston, Enbridge Gas, ENS, QMC, Save on Energy, Smith & Anderson, and Thermogenic Spoilers. And Enerlife is providing the technical director, direction of the program. And with that, let's get started. Ian is the Executive Director of Climate Challenge Network, and we'll start with the acknowledgements here. Thank you, Michael. Let's... Uh... Let's hope that uh, things go in the direction they should. Here we go. Right, as uh, uh, thanks, Michael, and welcome everybody. Uh, good uh, morning to people joining us from from the west, and uh, and good afternoon to everybody else in Ontario and points east. Uh, we begin all Climate Challenge Network events with land acknowledgement, and we do acknowledge with, with great respect the ancestral and unceded territory of the Inuit, the Métis, and the First Nations people that share these lands with us. I'm speaking from the tr traditional homes of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Uh, I'm actually situated in Toronto right now, which is the subject of Treaty 13, which is that land purchase of 1805, uh, which covers uh, all of Toronto down to the islands and up to the uh, the city of Vaughan. So uh, um, the, we, we always uh, hope, uh, we, we value the indigenous people that we work with along the way. We sincerely hope that the work that we'll report on today that we're doing with you and with others uh, does contribute to the common responsibility uh, we have as stewards of the environment uh, and also contributes to the ongoing work of reconciliation. So, uh, let me step along to where we plan to go through today. We only have one hour. We're very respectful of people's time. Uh, we have something like, I think, 250 people registered for this event. Uh, and we think that the message we have to bring today and the call to action is clear enough that uh, we can cover it adequately within an hour. If you have questions, uh, please do post them. If they fit into what we're trying to cover today, Michael will find a way to interrupt me and ease it into the conversation. Otherwise, we do commit to getting panelists and our own responses to all questions that get posted over the course of this. Use the Q&A within the uh, uh, the Zoom uh, functionality. We, as far as the engine, uh, as the agenda is concerned, we'll give you a bit of background. Uh, but many of you have been part of the story over the past seven years that we've been doing this reporting. I think the reporting is quite different and uh, quite uh, a lot more focused this year. We're going to run through 2022 results. How did hospitals, new hospitals, do over the past year? Uh, and that should be very much the why. The evidence should make clear why uh, where, why we need to take action. We need to make change. We talked about changing direction as the theme of this uh, this particular webinar. 
Uh, it, uh, you may recall, if you've been following along, it was titled Learning from the Best in the, in the Beginning. But as the data came in and as the picture became so consistently clear, uh, the need for change became apparent. And we're going to try to make that case today and that uh, it's a change to be made by all of us. We all have a part to play within this. So we'll look at 2022 results, what we deduce, what we learn from that, what the good performing hospitals look like, what the ones that have room to improve look like. But then we want to step into this idea of changing direction. Uh, all the way from governance, government regulations, all the way down to what each of us does on a day-to-day -day basis, whether we're operating hospitals, whether we're designing them, whether we're commissioning them, whether we're building them, whatever our role is, day-to-day -day decision making needs to change to get better outcomes. And we'll try to be convincing that those we, we need to have better outcomes. We need to have different outcomes. And the idea of learning from the best, uh, building on success, uh, when we were with Chess in Winnipeg, we uh, uh, we took part in the tour with Miles, who you'll be hearing from later, of the new women's hospital in Winnipeg. It sounded intriguing. It sounded like it had some of the features, but not all of the features we're seeing in top performing hospitals. Uh, Miles and John were good enough to provide us with the data. We ran the data and we have a new number seven on our list of top performers. And the key we think at New Women's is around operational excellence, and we really want to explore today um, the, 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 the work, the strategy, the efforts that have gone, gone on in that hospital since it opened a couple of years ago uh, that lead to what is pretty darn good performance today. And, and Miles will also, I think, share some thoughts about how they think they can be even better still. Uh, we're going to end with a call to action. We uh, uh, The four wins, we'll talk about all the different winners, because really everybody is a winner when we get this right. Uh, but the need for strategic collaboration and action, uh, we'll close with that. And that is a message to every single person on this call. Uh, we've got governments here, we've got utility companies here, we've got infrastructure agencies here, we've got hospitals, we've got industry players. Everybody has a role to play in the low carbon future. So let's drive into background. Uh, greening healthcare, I think uh, if you've been following the story since 2004, almost 20 years now, greening healthcare is all about a data driven approach to working together to significantly improve energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions reductions within hospitals. We are all about best practices, using data to identify best practices. We report every year on actual savings results uh, and document the hospitals that are making really big improvements. We undertake a good deal of data-driven research to fill in gaps in knowledge, fill in gaps in understanding. And what we're talking about today is one of those research, ongoing research initiatives into the actual performance of new hospitals. The uh, story so far is on our website. It's, uh, it's on the public website. You can find this information, last year's report is there, uh, working towards world-class energy efficiency. The derivative from this work, which is investigating top performing hospitals and coming up with best practice metrics uh, that make them different, how much, if they have a, a better, better level of energy efficiency, is it lighting, is it heating, is it cooling, is it fan power, is it medical equipment? What, where are the differences found? So that report is up there with metrics you can use now to calibrate energy models for future hospitals. And for Humber River Hospital, uh, top of the charts for, from the day it opened and has improved by more than 20% since it opened. Humber River Hospital, that case study is again online, not just in terms of the metrics and the building systems, but uh, the messaging from Bob Collins, the CEO of the vision, the values within the hospital that set the stage for exceptional world-class performance. So all of that is available to you. One extract from, uh, from the high performance systems report is the, uh, what we call empirical best standards practice. We, we can no longer be using assumptions and rules of thumb and folklore to populate energy models for new hospitals. We have empirical data available now from the best the best performing um, recently built hospitals. We have the data, 
It's coming from extensive submetering. It's documented. It's there. It's easy to weather normalize. And these are the kind of numbers for acute care and continuing care hospitals that you should be working towards around 30 uh, equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot for acute care hospitals um, that, that do the best, which is uh, what a uh, hundred kbtu per square foot, and around twenty for uh, for continuing care hospitals. So we know what good looks like, and we've achieved it already. And how do we do that on a consistent basis going forward? So let me uh, touch on to. Uh, what do we see in 2022 when, as Michael says, we continue to track the 19 uh, new hospitals built uh, primarily under a P3 model since 2005, that have opened since 2005, uh, and uh, now 20, and the 10 additional hospitals uh, and the folks on this call that have provided data for this, um, Great respect and thanks for doing that. As Michael says, we keep the data confidential, but we absolutely will be sharing it with you and engaging in the ongoing conversation. But um, I, we usually have half a dozen slides for this. I just want to show one, uh, like the challenge we have today. What this chart is, is the big benchmarking picture of, um, of acute, acute care hospitals and continuing care hospitals. We now have over a thousand hospitals, primarily coming from public data reporting uh, from across North America and uh, the National Health Service in England. What you see here is uh, every horizontal line is a hospital. It's blue is its electricity use per square foot. It's orange is its gas consumption, it's thermal energy, mostly gas, sometimes steam per square foot. Uh, weather, weather normalized to Toronto, but the data set can be weather normalized to any location. I know we talked to our friends in California before where we can move all these hospitals into Fresno, California and, and have a similar conversation. So easy to weather normalize. The end result looks a bit like this. We've got some highly efficient hospitals at the top of the chart using um, numbers below 100 kbtu per square foot that I presented a moment ago as being you know, a current good practice or a current best practice. Uh, but all the way up to um, several hundred kbtu per square foot, uh, you're over a hundred equivalent kilowatt hours per square foot per year. Those hospitals are out there. So this is our full data set, mostly existing hospitals. The 30 new hospitals we're reporting on today are the ones that are uh, highlighted, they're dark colored, and they've got a code alongside them. So you can see the A's and the C type codes. As Michael said, every hospital on this call, if you're part of the 30, uh, you should have your code. If you don't, send him a quick email or text right now, and we'll send you that code so you can follow the bouncing board. You can see the story as it comes along. The overarching conclusion for everybody to reflect upon today is that out of 30 new hospitals, all built since, all open since 2005, only 10 are in the top decile of the whole performance. Um, if we go to the top quartile of high performance, there's only four. Uh, we only add four, there's 14 there. Um, we have 20 out of those 30 hospitals that are better than the median, and we have 10 that are less good than the median. You see the little cluster at the top there. Those are all new hospitals. They're essentially a handful of new hospitals that we consider world-class and everybody else failed to meet that kind of standard that we know how to do, we have done, we've demonstrated, but we absolutely are not delivering consistent high performance. And that is the kind of the core message that we really wanted to share today. Every jurisdiction we look at has exactly the same outcome. Some really, really good, some average, and some not so good. They all need work. The, uh, again, core messages, if we can't, uh, if we can't get the new hospitals, if we can't get our brand new facilities right the first time, uh, what hope do we have for the thousands of older hospitals across the country that we have to bring up to these standards? So that's the core message. The why is we've got to do better. What we're doing right now is not working consistently well. So let's go a bit deeper into lessons learned. And I, I need to kind of share a bit of the greening healthcare methodology here. You'll find a white paper on our website that talks about the methodology 
but it begins with benchmarking. So here is a bit of a jaggedy kind of benchmark chart. And the idea is the big data sets for acute care hospitals, the data set for continuing care hospitals, for mental health hospitals, those data sets have a median performance in kilowatt hours per square foot after we weather normalize, and they have a top quartile performance. Greening healthcare is looking as a standard to get every hospital to the top quarter. That's not asking the ones that are on the left-hand side of that green dotted line to use more energy, saying they're already doing okay. They can still make further improvements, but if we can get everybody on the wrong side of the top quartile to the top quartile across North America, we estimate we will save more than 30% of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions, and that we can do so with a powerfully strong uh, return on investment, simple payback, life cycle cost, and whatever metric you want to use, this is what's economically available right now if we just can hunker down and make it happen. So the idea of the top quartile then feeds into, we publish savings uh, potential charts. So this is a chart of achievable savings potential. The horizontal axis here is percentage. And you see the uh, there are a number of hospitals can save more than 40% of their current energy use just by getting good, not by getting great, not by bleeding edge, not by massive capital investment and redevelopment, just by running the plant that they already have and running it as efficiently as it can be run. Uh, you see the, uh, the median in the middle, uh, once again, same coding on all the hospitals on the left-hand side. So this, again, is a subset of the big database, but all of the 30 hospitals are there. And you see the group at the top that by that standard, the top quartile for all hospitals, they're already there. They've got little or nothing left to save. Uh, but uh, the rest of these new hospitals, brand new hospitals listed all the way down the line there, uh, some of them are less efficient than the hospitals they replaced. We know how to do better. We can do better. And that's the story for today. I want to take you a bit deeper into the theory. We're breaking up that total annual energy use, that benchmark between the non-weather sensitive piece, base electric, and the cooling part, the extra use in the summer for the cooling systems. And each of those relates to different building systems. So we can benchmark these components individually, and they point to which systems are likely causing the excessive energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. We have the same with thermal energy use, that we have base thermal that's primarily attributed to reheat. And that's the biggest single difference between the top performing hospitals and the rest is that they've dealt with reheat. They've, they've managed it through better controls and they uh, are then supplying it with heat produced by heat recovery chillers. But the heating thermal, the winter usage, that's heat and humidification throughout the heating season. Once again, each of these components points to different building systems, and that allows us then to look at our top 10. So congratulations to the top 10. Number seven on this list is New Women's Hospital. Uh, the second one from the top is uh, is the most efficient acute care hospital we have. A1 is Humber River. And the rest know who they are, and they take pride in it. And uh, the greens mean they're already at or below the targets. So this top quartile practice, uh, good practice for different hospital types, existing and new. Uh, they're already there. Uh, and some of them still have a bit of room for improvement. Base electric, we know that's lighting, fans, maybe heat recovery, chiller. Cooling electric is the control of the cooling plant. Is that being done effectively? Uh, base thermal is looking at uh, reheat. You can see the very low numbers there, the 1.1s and the 2.4s and the 4.9s. Those have got reheat under control. The higher numbers, they're still doing well by comparison with the pack, uh, but they haven't mastered the, uh, the management of simultaneous heating and cooling in hospital handling systems. But this message goes from left to right. The uh, jurisdiction, the code which only the hospitals know, uh, the electricity, the thermal performance, the total energy performance, the savings potential, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions reduction potential, uh, and putting those numbers into metrics of kilograms per square foot. These are the top 10. Congratulations. These are the subject of great interest and focus from us to understand what makes them special 
to document that and share it with everybody else. But it's even at the top, it's not easy. <clears throat> this is the same chart, but we've added in what happened between 2021 and 2022 here. And you'll see numbers two and three on this list both experienced significant uh, gas consumption increases. It's not easy to manage these new hybrid low carbon plants with heat recovery chillers, with heat recovery equipment, with condensing boilers, with small package steamboat. With that combination of plant is difficult and challenging to manage. And even the most efficient are still working at this. So the operational challenges are there. So two and three, you can see the energy use went up. Um, um, uh, four and five are racing up the charts. You see the big reductions there. They, they've moved up significantly from the place they had left. So they are mastering this, but they're also going to be challenged when they get closer to the top. So the idea, this is a very dynamic market, very dynamic sector. Things are happening all the time. Some are improving, some are moving up, some are struggling to stay at the top. The rest of this, uh, again, every one of the hospitals knows who they are. This is the, the rest. This is the lower performing sites, how much energy they're using. And once again, we know where to look for the savings, base electricity. It's primarily fans, it's lighting, it's heat recovery chillers. Those are the primary issues with cooling as control of the air conditioning plant and the air handling systems with uh, base thermal, again, predominantly reheat. And look at some of those red numbers and they're on the actual. Uh, looking at uh, the, the heating piece, some of them are actually doing quite well with heating, but overall, not so much. If you look at some of these numbers, there are many hospitals can save over a million dollars a year. There are many, many hospitals that can save over a thousand tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. This is uh, almost, having done this for seven years, this is almost the starting point to say, we've got to do better, we can do better. And the call to action today is, let's figure out what that looks like. Similarly with the trends, you can see, uh, so we, again, we've added the change versus 2021. Many of the bad are getting worse, uh, but you see some making real improvements. We take real interest in those making double digit improvements because we want to document that. We want to share what they're doing share it with everybody so they can move forward. So the data tell us where we're, um, where we're at. They're a wonderful statement. They give us a sense of the trends. Are we moving in the right direction? The answer is, and you'll, uh, you'll see this if you're able to join us for the annual forum on December the 4th, that overall, no, we're not going in the right direction. Emissions due to hospital buildings should be going down and they're, uh, and they're, they're going incrementally up. There are many showing excellent savings and credit and thanks and kudos to them. There are at least as many that are going in the wrong direction and offsetting all of the savings. So sector-wise hospitals and, and the data set gets bigger and bigger, sector-wide, we're going in the wrong direction and we're running out of time to turn it around. That again will be the message and the call to action at the end. We know how to get it right. These are electrical interval meter charts over uh, the course of February in the winter time over the course of February 2021. Um, and almost all of you out there have an interval metering on your electricity meters. You can track it. So the top performing hospitals, they're the, see the blue one at the bottom. I believe that's A1. That's our friend Humber River. You see others uh, that are peaking higher and the valleys are significantly higher. Uh, those peaks and valleys can be used in commissioning to say, is the hospital the way working the way it was modeled and it was intended because that profile should match what came out of the model. All of that is, if you like, insight into how can we use data to do a better job going forward of delivering consistent high performance. But this fingerprint, this heartbeat of the electricity use in a hospital is a wonderful indicator, a wonderful metric of how well are we doing and where is the difference. Uh, if the difference is in the peak during the day, that's a very different opportunity or, uh, or solution than if the, if the valley is, is highly different from each other uh, during the nights and during the weekends. Um, 
So we have the benchmarks. You'll find this in the best practices and the high performance metrics guide that I showed you at the beginning on the Greening Healthcare website. These numbers, you know, your average daily max in the summer and average daily max in the winter. And these are acute care hospitals. There are equivalent numbers in there for continuing care hospitals. They're typically lower. What should the minimums be? Those are the values that you saw there. And is your hospital meeting that? And if not, you're leaving too many things running. What's the ratio between the two? Uh, on typical hospital days, good performing hospitals are running 70, 75% of daytime load during the night. Oops, I'm sorry. And we'll work our way back to that. So we have the metrics, we have the profiles, we can incorporate that in our current processes to calibrate the modeling and ensure the buildings are performing as intended. And we'll talk more about performance-based commissioning, which we see as a critical part of the future. Once again, I'm not gonna read all this to you, but if base electricity is not where it should be, it's in one of these areas. Fan power is the biggest by far. Uh, the heat recovery chillers that are appearing in more and more hospitals are the next biggest one. How well, how efficiently are they running? Uh, pumping comes next and lighting comes next. So if you get all those things right and we've got metrics, we've got standards for those things, you can measure your design and you can measure your operating performance against these things. And you can focus in on making the improvements to meet current standards, current best practices. Same with cooling electricity. The chiller plant is there. You should have metering in place. And if not metering, work, you should be adding metering to know what is the chiller plant doing? What is it doing in very hot weather? What's it doing in milder weather? Are we sequencing uh, uh, the equipment correctly? Are we, uh, are we right sizing it correctly? Similarly with hydronic pumping, you know, how many new hospitals have delta T's across hydronic loops that are way too low, which means they're over pumping and that's where the opportunities are. We got the metrics, we got the opportunities. Even more stark with gas, this is midwinter gas. Do you remember we saw the numbers for the top performing hospitals, uh, the yellow and the blue? And again, yellow is Peel Memorial Hospital. It's actually a geothermal system. Uh, the blue is the Humber River once again. And the rest are another group of hospitals with interval gas metering, where in the month of February, that's how different they were from each other. It's stuck, it's radical, and they're all real hospitals serving real patients, providing real services. Uh, even more pronounced in the summer, this is what August looks like. So once again, the, our two friends at the bottom, there they are. Um, that's what life is like without reheat. They still got sterilizers. They still got domestic hot water, still doing those things. But as you move further up this chart, the difference is reheat. Can you imagine that much gas is just due to simultaneous cooling and heating and why that presents the biggest single difference between the less efficient and the more efficient hospitals. So once again, when you look at your base thermal, reheat's number one, and we know how to fix that. Boiler plant efficiency is number two. Um, designers don't do a good job of sizing boiler plants for summer loads. Generally, the, the plant is too big, hard to control, and it's a very intermittent load. It's uh, the selections there may be one of the biggest single uh, inefficiencies we see when we examine some of these new hospitals. But domestic hot water, um, sterilizers and so on. We know how to do these things. They've been done successfully in many hospitals. We just got to do them consistently across all hospitals. Same with heating, heat recovery equipment, uh, heat recovery, the, um, you know, the standards for how efficient should heat recovery be, the design and control of systems. Uh, are they designed to be scheduled, properly scheduled? Are they designed for proper zoning? Um, where are we going with, uh, with, with humidification? Will we always be using steam? And if so, how efficiently can we do that? Or are we moving towards adiabatic systems? And are we providing for low temperature hot water design that allows for future heat pump operation and electrification? Again, nothing here that we don't know how to do. So the, the story so far, we hope that the why is compelling that we have to fix this, that I am not going to give uh, a lot of examples of what's happening with the climate. You see it every day, you hear it in the news. And uh, the, the truth is we ain't seen nothing yet. It's not going to get better, it's going to get worse.
So the why is very clear. We can do a better job with, with designing, commissioning, uh, building, operating, new hospital facilities, a far better job than we are right now. Most of the time we're getting it wrong. So the why is there? We just looked at the what. Uh, all the engineers, designers, operators on this on this call, they look at that and they they, they shrug. Of course, all of this is, is common knowledge. It's all doable, we can do it right now. So if we wanna change the outcomes, we have to change direction. And we just got two pieces of this. We wanna to talk to first, to governments and governance. Building codes and standards today that are in effect are insufficient to deliver consistent high performance. We need better, stronger codes. We need them for existing buildings, but even for new buildings, which is where they most commonly apply, uh, our existing building codes and standards are not delivering high performance and we have to fix it. On the governance side, uh, my question is, we have a number of ministries and departments of health on this call, but relatively few. Like, where are they at the table? Where is the policy that supports and requires higher performance? And we hope that the data will inspire them to modify policy, to modify, modify practice, modify programming to deliver the results we need. But then within hospitals and healthcare organizations, where is this on the board of directors? If if climate change truly is the pressing issue of our time, why would the simple piece of the efficiency and emissions due to hospital facilities not be on the agenda of boards of directors as a strategic priority? So those questions we put out there, this is already happening. Boards are stepping up, governments are stepping up, but we need to do it and we need to do it a lot more quickly than we are. So first, talk to governments and governance. Uh, now I just wanna to talk to the industry, we're part of this, but uh, raising the game. Uh, we know how to do this right, but we're not doing it right. So how do we change our processes, our practices to get it right? So within energy modeling and metering and building and the design of building systems, what do we need to do differently to get a better outcome? We talked about performance-based co commissioning. Why are we still just doing functional commissioning uh, when we're trying to deliver high performance? How can the commissioning agents modify their game, raise their game to prove that we've got the performance? If we model it right and we build it right and then we run it right, then commissioning should prove the fact, sure enough, all those curves are right on top of each other. They're right where they should be. What do performance-based contracts look like? We've got a lot of experience and pretty good experience. Like most of these high performance hospitals right now are in Ontario. Those contracts are working, they're continuously improving. How do we assign risk and how do we incentivize continuous improvement? And step four, which is operational excellence. The people running these plants, um, if they're used to running big old steam boilers sitting in the corner chugging away with pressure reducing valves here, there and everywhere, how do we develop them? How do we train them? How do, how do they adapt to this new reality of, of complex, low carbon hybrid plants. And if we don't get that right, we can build it as well as we possibly can. If it's not run properly, we're in big trouble. And within there, we see service contractors being key players as well. They stepping up and making sure the plant is run well because they're doing it perhaps in a hundred facilities where individual hospitals only have their own to work with. Uh, but this idea of the integrated building performance team, getting management, staff, and service providers together, looking at performance outcomes, setting targets, making improvements, making it work, we see as critical. Let's get on to uh, um, our friends at the New Women's Hospital. Again, if any of you were with us at the Canadian Healthcare Engineering Society annual conference, the national conference in Winnipeg, uh, the site tour was uh, inspirational for us working through. Um, this is the New Women's hospital in Winnipeg, in Winnipeg. Uh, and here are our friends who joined us today to talk about this. Miles, uh, the Director of Environmental Sustainability and Energy at Shared Health Manitoba, and John Ramshaw, who we met, both uh, took part in the tour that we had of the facility, which was, again, inspirational uh, for me, and I've seen a lot of hospitals, uh, but at Health Sciences, 
uh, center in, in Winnipeg. John, you know, we see as part of the inspiration behind how did they take uh, a new hospital and run it right, make it work. Uh, to get you familiar with the kind of the place, uh, nothing that people on the school haven't seen before. The floors are remarkably clean, John. We give you credit with that, but we got air handling systems. We've got uh, uh, enthalpy wheels. Uh, we've got um, the 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 individual pieces serving individual ORs with uh, humidification. We've got um, uh, volume control and volume measurements. Uh, so we've got all the kind of technology we would like to see. We've got uh, the cooling plant, we've got the, um, these I wanna hear a bit more about when we get into the conversation, John, these Mitsubishis as to uh, how much heat comes back from them during the winter time, because that's part of a net zero future. and. Uh, uh, but seeing where that is, we got the chilled water system that is running around the place. So the Honeywell building automation system tells us everything we need to know about what's going on. Typical air handling systems, the supply side at the bottom, the heat wheel uh, to the middle on the left, uh, recirculation line, uh, just in case of eventualities, the exhaust fan running through at the top. Again, just about every hospital online has these kinds of systems installed. Where does operational excellence fit in to make those things work? Uh, here are the kind of campus-wide chilled water system uh, that's running through. Uh, here's the secondary plant. We'll look at that in a moment. And uh, Miles, we'll come back to this at the end of uh, our, our conversation. Uh, this is the loop that goes through Health Sciences uh, Center, uh, connecting up all the buildings We where we started our tour was in central energy plant two with a, a very efficient chiller plant installation the older plant central energy plant in the bottom there they both feed into the loop and the loop has uh has has chilled water running around and uh, and and the warmer water coming back uh there are right now as i understand it correct me if i'm wrong uh, on the central energy plant, there are dry coolers there that in the winter, they used to be cooled by city water. And uh, uh, people can imagine the, the scale of the water savings after they were switched to dry coolers. But we're gonna chat a bit with Miles about the next generation that says we shouldn't be throwing that heat away anyway. How could we use that to, to actually heat the buildings? So, so that's the context. That's an idea of what the hospital looks like. It's, it's systems. Uh, Let's uh, get together with the Q&A and uh, Miles and John, I, I hope you're on the line. Absolutely, Ian. Great, John, are you there? Yes, I'm here as well. Nice <laughs> to hear. So that's, that's always a, a magic moment there where if, if, if silence comes back on the line and uh, uh, we're in trouble. Miles, let's start with, with you. And again, I got the questions there, but we'll let this go wherever it will. And once again, Michael will be watching the line. If you have direct Q&A to, uh, uh, to either Miles or John, then please post it up. I can't promise we'll include it because we've got limited time today, uh, but we, uh, we will promise to get back to everybody who posts a question with an answer uh, in, in, in the days following the webinar. Uh, Miles, give us a sense of Manitoba Shared Health. How big are you? How many hospitals? What's your vision? What's your philosophy? Um, what's happening in Manitoba? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, well, Shared Health is Manitoba's provincial health authority, and we provide provincial planning, health services, and operational support for the health system. Uh, Shared Health has over 18,000 employees working in all aspects of healthcare across Manitoba, and we work closely with the five regional health authorities. <clears throat> My team is uh, focused on environmental sustainability and energy within the capital and facility management group. And we lead and coordinate energy and sustainability initiatives that basically reduce the impact of healthcare on the environment, but also minimize the cost of healthcare through effective utility and resource management. And so, as you mentioned, a number of the strategies for decarbonization, I kind of look at three major overarching strategies. Uh, the first of which is energy efficiency. I mean, you can't get any better than conserving and not using energy to begin with. And then fuel switching from, you know, fossil fuels to renewables 
I think this is probably the most important decarbonization strategy for all buildings. And, you know, getting from fossil fuel to renewable in, in Manitoba, where we have an almost 100% electrical grid, means that electrification is something that we consider. Um, but we're also looking at others as well, like geothermal and RNG and solar as appropriate and cost effective. And then, of course, uh, innovation. Um, you know, we've seen lots of innovation in the past. We know that that will continue. So even though if we can't see all of the solutions today, we know that that will be something we have to keep open to and look for new ways to do things. So we try to do that. Th these are just basic strategies, but day to day we focus on obviously patient comfort. And I think that's where the operations team comes in, making sure the systems are doing what they're intended to do. And then you know, my team takes a deeper dive into the data and a lot of the stuff that you've been presenting to see, hey, are we, you know, is our performance on point and are our actions translating into moving the needle? And so, as you said, Miles, the Manitoba electrical grid is is crazy clean. It's uh, it's mostly hy hydraulic, I think, and uh, uh, and and just very very green. So electro and also not horribly expensive. Is that correct? Well, we have some of the best rates, yeah, in the country, uh, but it seems like all our rates are rising, so <laughs> we have to pay close attention. And the landscape is changing. Um, you know, we're we're involved with the utility to uh, participate in their integrated resource planning. And yeah, I mean, this decarbonization world that we're in is is going to mean that we need to use our electricity strategically. Yeah. So, John. Um, just about everybody on this call today is involved in one way or another with uh, with design, construction, commissioning, running of the hospital. You, you, I think you're with the hospital right through that uh, uh, that process. And in terms of achieving the efficiency levels you're at right now, what what kind of lessons learned? Uh, what kind of challenges were overcome that could help other hospitals on this call say, yeah, that's a good idea. We 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 could do that. What tips, what words from the wise do you have for folks on challenges you were able to overcome that have led to having uh, number seven performance right now? Well, I think personally, the challenges were, it, it was more about us getting involved right up front. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time working with the consultants uh, during design, reviewing, you know, um, trying to figure out uh, the right sequences, the right spec wording um, to, to get the building to run as, as well as it can, you know. Uh, so I don't know if those are really challenges. It, it is some work up front. Um, it is a lot of involvement with us. Uh, like I say, we were involved right through, even during construction, uh, through inspections, and, you know, from ductwork to all the installations. And John, who, who is we in this case? How big is your Sorry, team? We, we, we have, we have, in our in our maintenance group there is around 135 total you know they aren't all tradesmen but that's right through from leads of shops to to you know front office staff kind of thing and that's for um, winnipeg so health sciences not just the that's winnipeg health sciences okay so that's so, the 3.2 yeah. million so, multiple buildings yeah okay yeah yeah so, so I specifically deal with the HVAC and control side of it. Uh, so I have a team of 24, or I should have 24 if I could hire people. Uh, that so we, we, we were involved. Uh, we have, uh, between myself and my coordinator, we were involved with the design, uh, 
like I say, with the consultants, going through specs, uh, going through sequences, trying to get them to work as and worded as well as we could uh, without overcomplicating it. Yeah. Because I think you can certainly do that. And with the involvement of our team in it, you know, it it worked out good. You know, there's always challenges during construction. Uh, you know, for us, a big one, you know, it, it may not lead to to energy efficiencies, but is always access to equipment in ceilings and such. You know, we had countless hours and meetings and to try and make sure we were able to access, you know, because it's all about downtime and impact. For us. So, so, John, we saw that you've been making savings since the hospital opened just two or three years ago. What were the biggest things in your mind that you that were corrected after the hospital opened that kept the energy trending in the right direction? Um, you know, I we were in. You know, we were involved so much in the commissioning. I don't know if there was really much that changed. There was minor tweaks maybe after the building opened up because obviously, obviously your your heat loads change a little bit, you know, now that you've occupied spaces. But I think we were probably thorough enough going through the building and learning the building and its systems that we had it operating the way it should be by the time it opened up. Okay, that's just helpful. There's a whole bunch of little things and just making sure the place runs the way intended and having your staff hands-on directly involved in that work as part of a team. Yeah, absolutely. Love it. Um, so, Michael, let me see. Are there any questions that we want to add to the mix? right now that are on the stream here because obviously i've got more to come uh not too many and we're, we're kind of just taking them and uh writing out the responses okay uh, one of them one of them maybe you could touch on quickly i can't remember i remember it, uh, we discussed it in the call but what was the procurement model for this hospital it's not p3 but it was uh i think operated by the hospital is that correct yeah yeah it's typical uh you know, funded provincially and uh, typical, uh, you know, design bid build, uh, build type model. So um, I also noticed there's a question here about LEED certification. We did look at two certifications. So LEED was one of them, as well as BOMA. Uh, and both uh, this building meets that. Although I would say that the, you know, that's part of it. I mean, certainly uh, good design, uh, does help uh, with uh, you know performing buildings, but I think in this case what we're seeing is the you know the example of the operations team really helping to achieve some performance here that uh, I, I don't necessarily see all the time. So yeah, let's stay on that one if we could, Miles. The you know question three, the the new women's hospital, the operations team there. You've been you you've worked in a number of different settings in post secondary as well as as healthcare, what are the kind of key attributes that you see? I can't ask John this because he'll say it's good looks and, and hard work, but um, what do you think is the key attributes that other healthcare organizations should be looking for in the high performance team? They do seem to do things that we haven't seen other hospitals have the capability of doing. What sets them apart? Yeah, I, I think it comes down to like two things. I, and again, I don't know if it's so much setting apart as it is just executing good practice. Uh, but, it, you know, the team is very experienced. Uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of operational teams and um, they're really the unsung heroes of the facilities. I mean, they're the ones who work behind this, you know, behind the curtain, making sure everything runs smoothly and that patients feel comfortable and cared for. But they have to have a deep understanding of the building and systems. Um, and I think without that experience, it's impossible to operate a complex facility like this uh, at an optimal state. So, and I, John touched on the commissioning. 
you know, leading that process is huge. Um, you know, it's that team that lays the groundwork for smoothly operating a facility from day one, you know, starting with the owner's program requirements, uh, setting out the standards for what needs to be achieved, and then through design and construction, overseeing and making sure. Is it just me or did we just lose Miles? Yeah, we lost him. Okay. Uh, good timing if he was going to take a break. John, pick up on that because um, I, I was really intrigued with you. And you, you and your guys seem to be able to read uh, testing reports. We, we, don't, we, don't, we find hospitals who can't even find them, let, let alone read them. You, you, you figure out your own operating sequence for building automation. Can you talk exactly about when does your commissioning process, your in-house, your internalized commissioning process, when does it begin? What does that look like? Right from right from design. Right from right from design. Uh, yeah, we we review uh, specs, drawings, and everything right through. Uh, we you know, there the consultants are obligated to go through and do inspections. We do our own inspections as well. Uh, we work with the contractors. You know. Uh, the more you can have a relationship with the guys that are building for you, the better it seems to turn out, I find, anyway. Um, you know, and there's there's stuff you come across that can make a difference, you know, uh, years down the road. That, that could be a problem that could get addressed up front. But seeing it, it can get addressed out of time, and it's not nothing to worry about later on. And then it's the same same team that will then run the facility. So they've essentially Absolutely. got to know the place over the first two or three years during construction. So it's a more seamless switch into ongoing operations. Is that fair? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because everybody's seen the building. You know, yeah. I, I rotate people through it. Uh, you know, through the inspections and through the commissioning as well. So they know where everything is. They know how it should work. And they know where the gremlins are and the skeletons behind the wall. Absolutely. And why? Love it. Love it. Um, Miles, did we get you back? I think so. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's just touch on number five. You know, we're almost out of time and as as expected this is even more than i'd hoped for from you guys thank you so much for for sharing and uh, and and being specific because generalities don't always help um talk about where you're going from here with new women's hospital and the campus as a whole and it can either be on the campus where we talked about you know looking at heat recovery your low cost clean green electricity makes electrification look pretty pretty glorious or what your plans are with what you're learning uh, for your other hospitals across the province. Give us some closing thoughts on where do you go from here? What have you learned? What are you doing? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, looking at the data helps us understand what to focus on. And um, as you mentioned, the, heat re the, the reheat is one of the loads that's not uh, fully addressed in, in the new women's hospitals. So I think that's something we want to look at. Can we add a heat recovery chiller? Can we bring those temperatures down? Uh, those are questions we have to look at. Um, and then, as you mentioned, campus-wide, um, using you know using that chilled water system as a heat recovery loop to bring yeah. put energy in there and then draw it out, use that for preheating outside air or whatever we can use it for. But the idea is not to waste it. Um, we're always looking for cost-effective and repeatable measures, things that we can take elsewhere. So if we can get something like this working at HSC, then we can use that knowledge and, and share it and see if we can get it working somewhere else. So that's sort of the approach that we want to take. So you got those big dry coolers on top of the old central plant. When 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 are you going to re when are you going to decommission those babies? <laughs> well, I think we always need them in some scenarios, but hopefully we don't have to use them or we never hear them running. That sounds great to me. 
Okay. Uh, Miles, John, again, thanks not just for the time today you're putting into this, but uh, all the time you put in leading up to this and providing information and answering our endless questions and uh, working through this. Again, for these meetings, this is always the invaluable part where it's the practical frontline uh, support and advice. Uh, again, if there are more questions that uh, that we still have, we will forward them your way and we'll get answers back to everybody. But again, thanks for enriching the story or bringing the story to life today uh, where it's actually happening and we can we can do this. Uh, thank you both. Uh, this kind of a virtual round of applause here, just imagine it from across North America, there's, there's a ripple of, of, of applause coming forward. Thank you both. Thanks, Ian. Let's, let's go on to really the closing of the conversation today. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm hoping the evidence we see, it seems clear to us. I'm hoping it's clear to everybody. Uh, hoping the idea that uh, we have to change direction, we have to do things differently because as the as the Irish poet said, uh, Magnus is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a better outcome. Uh, so let me just summarize it this way for, your cons for everybody's consideration and in the hope that this is gonna be part of an ongoing conversation. Um, we, we will state categorically climate change is the most pressing crisis of our time. So we got some pretty horrific crises going on right now, uh, which which break all of our hearts. But uh, with respect to climate change, we ain't seen nothing yet in terms of the social costs, the economic costs, uh, the environmental damage. Um, and we're running out of time. You know, we set goals for 2030, we set goals for 2040, and we're going in the wrong direction to meet 2030, and it's only seven years away. So that's our starting premise. If if you agree with that, then the rest of this hangs together, uh, which is everyone has a part to play in doing this. Everybody on this call today can do things differently, including us, because we learn something every time we do one of these, uh, can do something differently tomorrow that will lead to better outcomes. So uh, we see climate change, we understand it, we feel it, we see our insurance premiums going up, we see the horrific weather damage, uh, we see all of those things happening. The government got to do something. Well, the government can't do something. It's uh, the nature of this particular crisis as it's down to us. We're all in this army. Uh, we all have a role to play. We've all got to do it together. We can't wait on the government because uh, the government doesn't have the tools to fix this. We do. That number three, that systemic change is needed. It's not just, oh, I, I can add that idea. Or I can add that concept. Uh, the processes by which buildings come together, in particular, new hospitals come together. Uh, when they're done correctly, and I would argue some of this has been conscious. Some of the hospitals we talked to that are high performance had no idea, uh, but over time we can start crystallizing. What is it that's different that led to this better outcome? But we're talking about systemic change. We're talking about a commitment from people, uh, from, from everybody, to, as of tomorrow, rethink their processes, rethink the way they've always done things, and I can for the commitment uh, if everybody responsible for one, for an existing recently built hospital and at the annual forum on December the 4th, we'll come to the bigger picture of, of existing hospitals, the older hospitals. But it, if we make the commitment to take the technology, all of the attributes we have in those new hospitals and focus over the next two or three years to get them up to the top of that benchmark chart. So that vision we have is every one of our new hospitals, recently built hospitals, is populating that top 10% of that chart. That is doable, we know how to do it, we know what we have to change, we know what we have to fix. So let's get all of those recently built hospitals there and every new hospital under development that people are thinking about right now on this call, put those metrics in place, use the empirical data, use the greening healthcare guides that are up there uh, and join in the conversation, talk to each other, talk to us talk to the team, kind of learn from all this stuff to get to the point that every new hospital that gets built um, in the years to come and until uh, and beyond 2050, uh, we get it right the first time. It's at the top of the chart from the day it opens the doors. We have the right operations, we have the right design, we have the right commissioning, we have the right practices. Uh, think about new collaboration models. Greening healthcare is a collaborative model. It's saying we haven't got time to figure this out individually. We have to work together, what are new service delivery models around commissioning, new construction, around performance guarantees? What are those 
things look like. And we need all the success stories and case studies we can get. We will publish them. We will document. We will share them. And uh, you know, finally, it's always the plug to Greening Healthcare is an open house. It's a big tent. Uh, join us in helping to map this out with you. Government, industry, hospitals, uh, whatever agency you are, uh, become part of this because we've got a long way to go and we're running out of time to get there. Uh, just finally, uh, the Greening Healthcare Annual Forum coming up at the Delta Hotel in Toronto on the 4th of December. Um, it's, it's always 100 plus people. So we were back in person for the first time last year with I think 120 people. It'll be a larger gathering this year. We've got a bigger venue for that purpose. And we will be going all the way from governance through to day-to-day -day operations. Like what are all the pieces that we have to realign to get hospitals working as efficiently as they can because everyone wants that. Uh, but it's also being highly respectful of the resources required to do that. Hospital facility staff are already run ragged. They're, they're already got more to do than can reasonably be asked of any human being. We're layering on this on top. Uh, what are the new approaches that will allow that to still happen and get the results? So please join us on December the 4th. We'll also be announcing our program for 2024. And finally, stay in touch. Uh, Michael, you heard at the beginning, he's our program manager with Greening Healthcare. He's been doing this for, uh, for over a decade right now. He's got great relationships with everybody. He's always available. Become part of this whole process. If what we're doing is of interest, Michael can connect you with the right people to uh, consider the possibility of becoming a member or finding other ways to participate and contribute. Amadeep Dial, uh, Amadeep is our technical director. He is responsible for all of the technical side that we've got here. Uh, this would not be possible without him. So connect with us, email us, stay in touch, follow the story, uh, join us on December the 4th. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a great day.